This week's episode is a conversation about the encroaching financial architecture of the legacy financial and banking system and how Bitcoin presents a critical path forward for people to imagine a future where basic rights, including the right to transact and have financial independence and privacy are protected. Our guest is Christian Ander, who is the CEO of Swedish Bitcoin exchange Gubit. And he has joined us to share his thoughts on what is happening in Europe and around the world, having been in this business for over 10 years. I'm Scott Deedles. I'm the CEO and founder of Block Rewards. And part of our mission in bringing Bitcoin to the workplace is helping people understand how it will help them. So if you're interested to learn something about how Bitcoin's unstoppable nature is intrinsic freedom technology, stick around. This is an important episode. All right, welcome to another episode of the Block Reward Podcast. We're joined this week by our special guest from Sweden, Christian Ander, CEO of Gubit. Christian, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me. Interested to hear your perspectives on uh, what's happening on the other side of the pond. Maybe before we start our conversation today for our listeners, could do, we just get a quick overview? You've, you've been involved in the Bitcoin space for a long time. And, uh, and how do we get here? Good question. Yeah, so... Basically, I, I found Bitcoin by an accident almost 13 years ago, uh, 2011. And for me, I was always been interested in open source, building stuff. I'm not a developer per se, but I like to do some coding. And I, I went to this uh, free open source uh, meetup and uh, suddenly I was talking to a guy. I still don't know who this is, but he orange filled me in, in 15 minutes back in 2011. So he... he Definitely did something <laughs> really good. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, maybe I was really open for it. I don't know. Uh, but I'm a tech guy and I like the, 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 the idea with open source money. So I, I, I probably was like quite easy to say. But from there, I, I started mining uh, the very same uh, night, actually, on my laptop. So it was, wasn't much, but it was still the, the start of, of, of my journey. And from there, uh, my, my background, I'm an academic, you studied quantum physics, uh, had nothing to do with finance or economy or, or money. I was kind of still a student. I was a PhD student, so, so I didn't have a, I don't know, a, a real job, if I can say that, but I, you know, still in the academics. So embarking on my Bitcoin journey, I learned a lot about money. And I still today, I learn a lot about money. And uh, it's, it's <laughs> every day I learn something new about money. I am still very grateful for that I found Bitcoin. It's like, oh shit, it's, yeah, whatever it is about money. And I, I'm so happy. I, we, actually, we, we have Bitcoin. So you and I met in, uh, in the spring, uh, leaving the, uh, Atlantis conference in, uh, Madeira, Portugal. And, uh, I was fascinated to hear just a short, uh, summary of, uh, your story of what you're going through right now. So you're, you're, uh, you're operating a, an exchange in Sweden and, uh, you don't, your, your company doesn't have a bank account in Sweden. Correct. So to circle in with uh, the story I just shared, uh, I started a, an exchange, BTCX, uh, one year later in 2012. And, uh, just as an experiment, like, okay, do, do, do people really want to buy Bitcoin in Sweden? I, I mean, I did buy Bitcoin back in the days from Mount Gox in Japan. And it was quite a hassle. It was slow and expensive. And I was like, okay, we, we, I, I can help out here. And, and from there, I just, you know, open a bank account, you know, onboarded customers, starting selling Bitcoin. And I, that's exactly what we do today. But during these 13, 12 years for the company, I noticed that the banks didn't really like Bitcoin. <laughs> and that's not a news for anyone today in the Bitcoin space. But in Sweden, it's particularly difficult. Currently, there's just one company in Sweden that has a bank account and is working with Bitcoin. And yes, so, so you get the, the magnitude of it. it it's, um, I know another company who are doing tax software. Software to efficient your, your tax filing. And they added Bitcoin to their platform and they, they lost their bank account for doing that. And <laughs> it's like, come on, they're not even touching Bitcoin. They're just helping people to pay taxes. And, and, and that's, that's Sweden. And it, it's, it's funny because I've been thinking of it 
of this. Why is it that Sweden stands out as being so Bitcoin uh, hostile? And I talked to a lot of people around the world. I'm not sure if this is true, but, but the story goes something like this. There's a family in, in Sweden called Wallenberg. They've been around for many, many years. Uh, they own the biggest bank, which my company actually had a bank account with for many, many years until a few years back. And this family, they kind of control the financial sphere in Sweden. They're engaged in businesses, you know, big businesses, even uh, uh, military and defense uh, business. And they, so now is where I haven't checked the fact, but they were part of starting the Federal Reserve in, in America back in the days. And that's also interesting. Okay, so they're part of the Bilderberg Group, this is fact, uh, which have a, like a huge network of, of influencers people uh, taking decisions. And so I started thinking, okay, so this family, they, they kind of run the, the, the scene in Sweden. There's just four, five major banks in Sweden, so they're not, it's not very competitive. And the authority regulating the banks, they are as actually also working together with the banks because if you if you want to work with the, the financial authority, you start in school, obviously, studying law or finance, and then you start working at the authority, and your next step is working at a bank. So when you sit at this uh, authority, you want to have a good CV so you can get hired by the bank. And if you're not following what the agenda of the banks are proposing, you, you, you will not get a work. So, so it's, they're very tightly connected. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not really working uh, as it should be. It works that way with the media in Canada. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's also funny because the media in Sweden is also one family owning most of the media. So, <laughs> so, so it's kind of, you know, very dense. But the story doesn't end there. I, I just want to leap forward. And we also have the oldest central bank in the world in Sweden still operating. It started in the 1600s. And apparently, the ancestor of this family of Wallenberg also started that central bank. So it's like, holy shit. Here in Sweden, a small little freedom country, you know, the lakes and forests and stuff. Like, oh, we're kind of maybe the oldest running family of the central bank, I don't know, dynasty, how to say. It. Okay, this might sound very crazy, but like, okay, maybe that's why they really hate it. I don't know. But here I am running in a Bitcoin exchange in Sweden. We don't have a bank account. <laughs> it's still like we're fighting the, 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 the longest family uh, lineage of, of central bankers. And yeah, and um, yeah, here I am. Yeah, it's an amazing, you know, business complication to even have to comprehend. And uh, actually, our episode one of the show was with a Canadian. Uh, sort of counterpart of yours, Adam O'Brien, who we, you know, in that episode, we talked about a very similar thing where uh, the banking industry in Canada is also similarly consolidated. And, uh, and there is a lot of debanking happening here, uh, which is probably not quite to the extent where you have had to go uh, actually outside of your borders just to function as a business financially. Yes. Yeah. So today we have a bank account in England and we have another one in Liechtenstein. And even our fellow country uh, uh, neighbor, uh, Norway, we have an account uh, with. So all our transaction is, you know, routed through outside of Sweden and then it comes back to Sweden. I, it, it's a big hassle. Uh, it's, it's friction and we're doing what we can to, to help our customers to, to have as a good, good journey anyway. And uh, on, the, on the good side is what hap what's happening now with the EU. I really don't like the EU. Like it's like regulatory volcano spits out new regulations every day. But sometimes they actually for is for our favor. And and they have this uh, payment initiative stating that uh, payment service provider or payment initiation providers uh, they cannot be what's the English word in um, discrimination with the banks so now we have uh, a few payment service providers who want to work with us and the banks cannot stop them so we're uh, as we speak we're 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 getting ready to to launch this new payment rails in in sweden 
And it's thanks for, for EU. Credit you when credit is uh, <laughs> due, but otherwise, yeah, so it's going forward. Yeah, there's, there's an interesting, you know, like it's an intersection of, it, it's not just a business's ability to do business, but it is also the sort of free citizens of that country's ability to spend their money uh, how they want to spend it. And uh, so, uh, you know, this kind of, yeah, it, it's a crossover point of a few different issues where I think impacting people's ability to have sort of autonomy over what they do with their money is in itself a, a very problematic thing that uh, is maybe getting swept into some kind of like larger uh, argument that, you know, Bitcoin is for something else or or businesses that sell Bitcoin are doing something else. And, and you recently... Uh, retweeted an, an article from Cointelegraph talking that, about the Swedish government considers crypto exchanges to be essentially just for money laundering. Yeah, yes. And and that's the financial authority who is supervising the, us and also the, the banks. And they're having a, a very hostile uh, approach to, to Bitcoin, which is definitely... Uh, in in one way, it might even be illegal for for them to have this approach to a certain Bitcoin, but but they also have the right to to write reports like this. But it, but it, it's also very interesting because the the general director of of um, financial inspection, or actually the the last one, he he uh, tried to ban Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining is actually very big in Sweden because we have cheap renewable hydro energy in the Nordics. So sometimes the price is, is, is negative. I mean, really cheap. So you actually get paid off to, to consume energy. And Bitcoin miners love this, of course. Uh, imagine being a Bitcoin miner, you get both fiat money and Bitcoin. <laughs> and, and the surplus of, 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 of the heat you get from, from the miners, you could sell to a nearby city. And they pay a lot for that. So it's very profitable. And uh, the, the, the general tried to to ban Bitcoin mining in Sweden. So he flew down with his, uh, of course, not very environmental friend, uh, friend airplanes, private yet, to the Brussels to try to, to ban it. And fortunately, he, he failed. Uh, but he, he was also very, in the organization, he, he, he kind of made the organization, the, the financial supervisor, very hostile to Bitcoin as well. So when Mika regulation, the, the European uh, crypto, regulation came along, they appointed a, a, a Bitcoin skeptic to implement the EU legislation in, in Sweden. So it's like, oh man, come on. It's like, and what even more funny, after that, he got to be the general of the central bank of Sweden. So, so it, it's a very small pond, Sweden. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, that's how it is. Yeah, it, it's amazing how you see the difference of, you know, we're, we're still very much in the early days, but uh, there was a recent announcement that Bhutan has been mining as a country and essentially have probably already mined a, a Bitcoin stash that could change the entire future of that country forever. Uh, El Salvador is mining. And, uh, you know, in the province of Canada that I live in, it, it's essentially impossible to get an electrical hookup to, to mine for new Bitcoin miners. And, uh, and we, we're the same. We have an abundant hydro. Uh, there's, there's plenty of capacity. Cold places and, and cold places in general should be thinking about Bitcoin mining for the, uh, multiple, as you mentioned, uh, you know, there's, there's multiple, uh, positive outcomes, uh, for large scale Bitcoin mining in cold places. It's, uh, it's crazy. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it should be definitely. Uh, and also in every household in, in Sweden, uh, you, you know, you have to heat your house, right? It's not that common you have like a, a, a normal convection radiator, meaning that you just plug in electricity and you get heat. People do have that in Sweden, but it's not that common. Usually in Sweden, you have a heat pump, which basically it's, it's like an air condition, but in reverse. So, so you get the warm, warm heat and, and you, you put in one kilowatt hour of energy and you get four kilowatt hours of the um, heat. So basically you, you get four times the more heat. But the, the process in that heat pump to, to warm, it's, it's a gas which is going through different physical states. You could have a Bitcoin miner. So basically every household in Sweden could mine Bitcoin because they're, they're spending the energy anyway. 
So it, 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 it doesn't impact the, the, the energy consumption of the country, actually zero. It, it will just be a bonus. So whatever, you know, you still need to have those cheap ASIC chips. I don't know what they cost, but they should, shouldn't be that expensive. But I have no idea, actually. But I think that, that could be a, a huge profitable business. You know, upgrading your, your, your uh, heating system with, with a Bitcoin miner and, and boom, instantly you have heat, you have no effect on the energy bill and, and you just have a Bitcoin miner. And you also may uh, help out secure the, the Bitcoin network. So it's, uh, it, it, I guess for us, it's a no-brainer, but <laughs> idea to market. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a spa somewhere, I, it might be in Canada, that, uh, that uses Bitcoin mining to heat their, their hot pools. Awesome. I have to go there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the future of, uh, the future of relaxation. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, it's such an interesting time. I see, uh, and there was another news story this week about a, uh, I believe it was in Belgium, Bitsaga had also been debanked. And you see at different levels of, uh, of sort of a pro, uh, increasing financial surveillance in Europe, uh, talks about lowering the, um, the maximum allowable cash transaction in different countries. I think it's 500 euros in Greece and maybe a thousand in France. And uh, obviously as inflation continues to devalue money, you know, even 500 euros today might still be enough to, to buy something significant, but in, in five years or in 10 years, this is going to be like a haircut, right? It's uh yeah, it definitely, this is glo- a global problem. It's not in only EU, it's, it's America and I guess Canada. Uh, I'm not sure how it looks there, but I, I guess it's coming there. It's not already there. And it's the FATF. I don't know the abbreviation of, of that, uh, but it's a financial task force, something. Financial action task force. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Actually, we hired a, a senior person from, from that task force to, to our company. He, he changed side a, a year ago. So it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that, that's the pro thing. More and more people are, you know, chasing side when they realize like, oh shit, where's this ending? Oh, it's, it's going to total fascist in a way. And, and, and they, they, they realize that that's not the side they want to be in. And then some of them come to Bitcoin. So to our company, but yeah, the financial oversight and privacy, we also have the telegram CEO story arrest and, and what, whatever happened there. And, and, and this is definitely one of the, key aspects i'm i'm um, trying to communicate to 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 many people in in sweden and also in, in europe that that privacy is is it's not it's it's not only important it's it's actually life and death in in some cases especially if you look at the geopolitical scene we're entering now with more wars and more tension and polarization everywhere in the world privacy is super important i mean who knows if if some of your normal you know personal information comes out and some state or just a terrorist or an idiot gets that information and wants to do something bad with you and and uh, and that's why privacy is on a, a life and death matter and the thing which is also quite the opposite with bitcoin and what media is reporting is the old, I want to call it a lie, the old lie that Bitcoin is anonymous, which is not. Uh, and as a, a regulated Bitcoin company, we use these tools to analyze the blockchain. If we have a customer, we need to check, okay, where does this Bitcoin come from? But also where does the Bitcoin go after they have been bought at, uh, at our exchange? So we, we kind of realized that, okay, the biggest problem with Bitcoin is not anonymous, that is an anonymous chip. Anonymous. <laughs> it's the opposite. It's it's uh, transparent, which make it makes it very easy for anyone to to uh, to see what what are people actually doing on the blockchain. And I have personally a very good example of this when when I was transferring Bitcoin from one wallet to another, and uh, a few months later I got a, a letter from the authorities like, oh hey, we saw you make a Bitcoin transaction. Was this a, a, a sale? Did you sell your Bitcoin? And they wanted to have like uh, my receipt, uh, sales receipt and have taxes. I was like, holy shit, they're monitoring my wallets. <laughs> I was like, Jesus Christ. So in BTCX, which is uh, the Bitcoin exchange uh, I started, 
we have uh, started to work to implement a higher level of privacy. For example, the Bitcoin wallet address, as soon as we're done with it, we just erase it, or at least encrypt it, one-way encryption. Um, and being a financial company, it's always difficult because you have to comply with storage of information and customer KYC, etc., and the money and laundering laws. So we, we're about to, to release an update where we can minimize the KYC data we have of you and also the Bitcoin address you use. So in that case, even if someone, God forbid, would hack our database, or if a government comes along, or if another kind of illicit actor tried to extract information from our company, it's not there. It's like, it's the best privacy technique you can have. It's, it's not even to have the information. And uh, we're also um, very inspired from uh, Asabi. Unfortunately, they, they kind of merged into something else or have to, they ha- also had to protect themselves from, from the government. Uh, I'm not sure on the details there, but, uh, but we're, we're working with them to, to also find a, a solution to, for, for privacy. Yeah, I think uh, for people who don't uh, understand the significance of the kind of like battle that's being fought on this territory uh there are some very smart and motivated people today dedicating their efforts to ensuring there will be some privacy in the future you know i I think you made a great point earlier and i couldn't agree more you know this often i hear and i heard this a lot in 2020 about you know privacy is only for people who have something to hide and uh and and i just couldn't disagree more right it's just privacy is a fundamental right and uh you know we we should we should feel that we have, uh, you know, we all have a, have this, yeah, it, it's something that everybody is, is entitled to, to some degree. And it doesn't at all imply that you're doing anything wrong. Another point you made, which I think is, is a good one. You know, the idea that Bitcoin is anonymous, which is not true. Uh, it's very easy to track. I personally feel that the use case that should be more appealing for people is that it's unstoppable money. Not the, it's not about hiding the money. It's, it's, a, it's a technology that enables you certainty that you will be able to transact that money however you want, because it is essentially impossible to prevent Bitcoin from being sent to one address to another. And to me, that is the thing, because as these things like uh, any money laundering and cash transaction limits become more restrictive over time these are you know these are getting back to the start of the conversation right these are the choke points that are available to the to the the banks that are 400 years old and they're trying they're going to you know naturally try to preserve their control as the technology sort of rests away from them and and really you know i think this is a critical thing for people to understand about bitcoin as a technology technological innovation is that it has it has freed money from having to move through centralized points. And, uh, and in that way, it becomes impossible to prevent from it being moved around. It's, it's an excellent point you're making. Unstoppable money. I, I really like that. And that's also how, how I started back in 2011 and 12. I read my mission statement a, a few months ago when I was updating a document. And for me, it's like the mission statement which still is valid. It's like financial empowerment. We, we want to empower people to be financially free. And, and to become financially free, you need to have money that is free. Otherwise, you're always dependent on someone else. And that's the definition of not being free. And the government is actually making a very good PR push for, for Bitcoin in that way because every day it's getting harder to make transactions. It's getting more controls, more questions, and more and more people are getting pissed off with the financial system. And like, ta-da, and here we have Bitcoin. So the, the, the more they're pushing this, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous the amount of anti-money laundering procedures and laws we have today. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And what is more is there is no scientific proof that it's actually working. Yeah, any money laundering has nothing to do with catching criminals and everything to do with surveilling ordinary people, right? Because uh, they, they know where the criminals are. You know, this, this is, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's so stupid. So, so it's just, I don't know, it's like, it's, it's, it's just for one thing and it's controlling normal people. It's not for stopping crime. And yeah, it's, 
like, I don't know, I would actually not know what I would be doing today if not Bitcoin were around. I, I would probably join like an Amish uh, society somewhere like, okay, fuck this. <laughs> I'm growing my whole food in the forest without any technology. But fortunately, we have Bitcoin today. So, so it, it's, a, it's a really good, uh, good tool. Yeah. It's the best tool, you know, and I, and I think like for, for most people, the average person really just wants to, you know, enjoy their, their life, be a part of society. And, you know, as part of that, it does involve, you know, having some privacy and the freedom to spend your money the way that you want to spend it. You've earned it and you've paid taxes on it after that. And like beyond that, if you're not doing anything illegal, that's kind of where it should end, right? you know, in my mind. Definitely. And that's also come comes back to the social contract which also if you go back i don't know the date but let's say a few hundred years before tax like what was the main point of paying taxes it was to protect your your shield from being robbed or burned or pillaged uh, so you paid the king to have some knights protecting you it was a really simple agreement like here you have some of our food and we get some of your protection and today, the tax system, it's, it's so far away from the original purpose. Uh, and and uh, I just tweeted uh, today, like, oh, tax is theft. It, it shouldn't be theft, but today it's more or less theft because it's, it's, it's not doing the purpose as it should be. And after Russia invaded Ukraine, you could also read headlines that are oh, Germany, which is the, the driving economy force in, in Europe, was going to invest, I think it was 1,000 billion euro in defense costs. I mean, insane. Like, okay, that, that, it's like, okay, okay, yeah, tax should go to defense, but that amount of money, we, you, you don't, you don't have a say. You don't negotiate like, okay, we, it's insane. And, and basically that will also go to fund. A war, probably. Yeah, and not only that, but uh, the creation of that money is an arbitrary dilution of the money you've already earned. And, uh, you know, it, it is a, a sort of secondary, a discrete form of taxation by, by devaluing the money that, you, that everyone else already has to, to create that spending. You know, it's like there are two sort of normalized, it's the normalization of creeping tax. And tax is also, not only did they, they were introduced, but then they just, they forever grow into a bigger and bigger part. And, uh, and this is just sort of an accepted thing. And the other ex accepted thing is this idea of inflation target. And there was a, another European announcement today about Christine Lagarde, the head of the e European Central Bank, feels pretty good that 2025, they'll be getting back to the 2% inflation target, which is, you know, their way of broadcasting to people that, you know, when we do our job, your money will only be, you know, worth 2% less next year instead of 10 or you know, when we do a really bad job. And, and this is kind of, these are just accepted things. Yeah. You know, I, I have a quote from, uh, from David Bradley, who's uh, a good friend and has been on the show. And uh, he, he tweeted this the other day. He said, for the first time in history, information technology allows for the creation and protection of assets that lie entirely outside the realm of any individual government's territorial monopoly on violence one of the other really weird things and this totally gets to your comment about social contract which is what i was thinking about that is the state absolutely does have a legal monopoly on violence which they apply however they see fit regardless of you know we so we get to vote however regularly it is in the country you live in and then after that it's done and uh, if they decide to wage international violence and to de devalue your money to do it, that is something that really no one has any say in. So this idea of uh, having a, a money system that exists entirely outside of that, to me, is, uh, is such an interesting way of rephrasing another critical part of Bitcoin's value proposition for people who, we, we, you know, we're not going to be able to do anything about the federal government decisions, but you can sort of peacefully opt out by just choosing to not have your money sitting inside a system that is going to pay for that stuff. Totally. And that's historically, I mean, we, we had gold, 
right? As a currency or silver and, and, and copper. And um, in England back in the days also when, when gold and copper and silver was used and the, the king of England was it King Richard. I don't, I'm not that good in history, but uh, it could have been the, the Robin Hood king, if you know the, 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 the story. And he decided, oh yeah, I want to wage war with the French people. Because I don't like them for some reason and wanted something from them. So they diluted the, the, the coinage the, the, with, with something else. I mean, basically, it's supposed to be pure. But, uh, but the market reacted quite quickly and said, oh, the new coins from the king. Oh, but they're not worth as much as the, the older coins. So you instantly got inflation with the new, new coins. So it's like they... they they, the, when I say they, I mean like the, 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 the king or the power who is making the laws and, and, and the money is always trying to dilute the currency. And now we have the fiat system. I mean, basically, I mean, we have the perfect fiat system. We have central, central banking, you know, digitalized with the banks operating for them. Uh, and so, so it's, um, so it's kind of perfect that we actually get Bitcoin in, in this area. So, so we can easily opt out from, from. From that. Yeah, the system is not broken. It's working to perfection. The system exactly. is designed to <laughs> yes. effortlessly create more and more money all the time and make your money worth less in uh, in doing so. This, this is it's it's a it's a great gig if you are the ones controlling uh, banking and currencies. It's like you know, it's never been easier. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, and the same thing happened with the U.S. in 1933 when they they needed to uh, reestablish gold reserves. And so they, ca- they confiscated gold and then sort of immediately repriced it. And so, so this has happened, you know, countless times through history, to your point about, yeah, this is an old trick. It's a very old trick. I mean, falling for it every time. That, that's, the, that's the funny thing. And what, what also I think could, let's say, say work, work better is the, is the media. So the media's role, as I see it, should be to inform the public and to be critical about the government and makes us more aware of how we should vote in the, in the next election, for example. And uh, if you look at, at the media today, it's, it's, it's um, kind of the opposite. It's supporting the, the current narrative. And if you, if you take America, you have the Democrats and the republics. I mean, both of them are, are I mean, they're basically the same in one way because they're supporting, none of them will kick out the central bank of the Federal Reserve. I mean, it's still, you know, the structure. So it makes everyone to believe they can do a change by voting on A or B. It's like, no. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's, uh, and it's the same, of course, same in Sweden. We have two political parties, which are the bigger ones. And they've been around for, a hundred years. So, so, and it's always like left against right. And it's like, that's, that's not what it's about. It's like, it's the system or it's a new ideas or it's a political shift or basically as a shift of, of power. Because the longer you have the same power. And, and now I'm saying it's, it is the same power if you vote left or right. Because they've been around so for, for so long. It's, the longer it, it runs, the more corrupt it becomes. Because it's, it's the power structure you find, you, you build, you know, loopholes for, for things to, 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 to corrupt it basically. Uh, so, so you need to shift it. And, um, yeah, and, and that, that, that's the role that the, the media should, should take to, to really be a help, a helpful hand in, in that, um, Part, but it's not. It's it's taking the other way. So it's not just that we have the the perfect fiat system operating. We also have a, a very strong media supporting it. So so then, from one thing about privacy and Bitcoin, we come to another, which is communication. The freedom freedom of speech is also extremely important. And then luckily, we we I haven't actually used it so much, but it seems like Noster is a good tool for that. I'm really into Bitcoin and I understand this technology a lot, but I don't understand Noster, but they <laughs> say it's a good decentralized uh, protocol for communication, which is 
extremely important as we go down the line of history as well. Yeah, I think there's, a, you know, de- decentralization and, you know, the, the concept of if you can understand the unstoppable nature of a Bitcoin transaction, you know, and money, money is information technology, right? So you're, you're sending information. And so I think that, you know, the, the extension of understanding the unstoppable, uncensorable sharing of information will inevitably lead to you know, sort of a waterfall of innovation that has this idea embedded into all kinds of things. So to me, the core of it is being able to exchange value. Because if you can do that in an unstoppable way, then I can pay you to use your skills to create something, you know, an idea. And uh, so, yeah, the the idea that uh, money that Bitcoin, the unstoppable money is is the foundation for, uh, you know, I think it's a digital renaissance. I think we are headed for a totally new way of, of imagining society. And uh, yeah, we'll see how we get there. Yeah, I was, uh, I've been thinking about this since the start of the episode. I'd love to maybe before we uh, move on, ask you a, a, a quantum physics question about Bitcoin, which is something I'm interested in, I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in quantum mechanics myself. And I wonder, uh, your opinion on, uh, what do you think that the consensus obsession with the Bitcoin price in fiat has to do with the price? <laughs> this okay. is like a double slit Bitcoin's price and the double split experiment. Yeah. Well, of course it has. Of course it has. Yeah. I mean, my, my, my 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 let's say non quantum physics answer would be uh the 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 obsession with with price of any asset makes it go up higher and and down uh, lo- lower i mean it, it it just you know accelerate whatever trajectory it, it it's going from a quantum perspective i'm not sure how to answer that but i can say there, there are many aspects of of bitcoin i i think is you know, solid and unstoppable, and 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 many problems people talk about. Oh, this this is the biggest problem with Bitcoin. I personally think privacy is is, is one of them, uh, but another one is actually quantum encryption and uh, quantum uh, computers. I, I was doing my my masters in in quantum uh, computing and uh, was building a a quantum algorithm, a very very simple algorithm. I don't even remember what it, it was doing, but it was super simple. But the logic when you do with quantum computers is super different. So it's it's really hard to to get into the mind space of, of, of thinking. Uh, I do prefer normal logical computers, uh, but but the power. I mean, we 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 do have two encryptions, what they call them, algorithms in in Bitcoin, the SHA two five six for m- mining, and then you have the elliptic curves for for the private key. And I have to say, I'm I'm not a quantum physicist, computer scientist uh, expert today, and <laughs> but I can see that that might be one of the things I'm, I'm a bit concerned about when co- quantum computers become too big and too powerful. They will crack any encryption we, we have. So it's not a, a Bitcoin problem. It, it's basically a, a digital problem. How could we send information um, with privacy? That, that's, that's the problem. And then when the, the solution is, of course, uh, a quantum encryption. And the good thing with quantum encryption, it's uh, unhackable, actually. Then you have, by the laws of physics, you, 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 you cannot uh, violate them as we understand today, at least. So that's the upside with with quantum encryption. It, it, it in, uh, and guarantees a hundred percent privacy. But the transition, how will that look when we go from a, a classical, let's call it, information age to a crypto? No, sorry, <laughs> quantum uh, information age. And um, how will Bitcoin lead through that? Uh, journey and i believe it will happen within the next 50 years so it's definitely within the realm of, of the bitcoin history i i will leave that to the listeners to 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 solve yeah i uh you know i think i i, was, I don't know anything about quantum computing myself other than a handful of things i've read i did actually read uh we're recording this on october 10th there was a uh, bitcoin amsterdam has just happened and there was a presentation 
at that uh, at that conference uh, with a with a proposal around how to integrate a solution on top of uh, elliptical curve to uh, quantum proof the the Bitcoin. The concern is that the public keys will be cracked, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, without getting too far in the weeds, my, my hope is just in the same way that we've been talking about over the whole, the, the entire conversation as, as new technologies emerge and new threats to privacy and freedom emerge, there will be people who have the desire and the talent and the know-how to use those same innovations to create new solutions. And, uh, and Bitcoin really is this, uh, beautiful sort of living organism that it, because of its open source nature, it's a problem that people anywhere in the world can have a look at, have a think about, contribute to if they, uh, if they want to try. And, uh, you know, that on its own is, is, uh, is a pretty interesting and, uh, maybe sort of quantum idea in itself as we all stare at this thing and it, and it becomes, uh, something different as a result of us paying attention to it. Indeed. So very beautiful put. And I would say in, in that aspect, it's basically the hope of humanity where for the future of Bitcoin, we, we can hope that people will still be fighting for freedom and privacy. Our children will still have the, the drive, build a thriving society where we can be free. And, uh, freedom is, it's not a state we achieve. It's like an infinite war, if you want to call it, or infinite aspiration. We, every generation need to aspire for, for the freedom and truth to, to, to win. And currently, I would say Bitcoin is the, the path today. But in 50 years, it might be something else, or we don't know. But it's, it's the aspiration that we humans continue to thrive like this we have to trust on that's very well said maybe we'll wrap there christian this has been a very interesting and insightful conversation i want to thank you for coming on uh for our listeners who uh maybe would like to find more of you online is there anywhere we should point them directly uh the, the most easiest is uh our webpage bt.cx it's our exchange but you can also always find me there otherwise i'm on on, on twitter christian ander and find me there so whatever wherever you choose and we will include those links in the uh, in the show notes of course and uh yeah so thank you again and uh if you're listening and you made it all the way to the end of the show i want to thank you as well for tuning in and hope to see you again next week cheers everyone thanks for listening to this episode of the block reward we're trying to do something different here creating accessible conversations meant for people who aren't obsessed with bitcoin if you found this episode informative and engaging hit that subscribe button to make sure you stay updated with future episodes your feedback matters we'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a moment to share your reviews and help us with our goal of creating bitcoin content that is simple and easy to understand bitcoin has an important role to play in the future of finance it will change the way we save spend and invest Discover why Bitcoin offers a game-changing opportunity for forward-thinking employers by visiting blockrewards.ca. BlockRewards mission is helping Canadian employers implement strategies for integrating Bitcoin into compensation and benefits. Supercharge your recruitment and retention strategies and help your team members plan for the rising cost of living by rewarding their work with the hardest money ever invented. Special thanks to our top sponsor, Paramount Employee Benefits Consulting, Canada's only Bitcoin forward benefits and pension advisory. For more information, find them at paramountbenefits.ca. Big shout out to Podigy, our production team that makes all this possible, and BMX Escape for producing our music. Bitcoin is an expansive and dense topic many people walk away from early. To Bitcoin enthusiasts looking for that podcast they can share with friends, family, and colleagues, one they'll actually listen to, we hope that is us. The content of these conversations is meant to be provided for information purposes only. Nothing here is investment advice. Bitcoin is a big topic. Be sure to do your own research before making any personal financial decisions. Thanks for listening. 